Welcome to the iPad Podcast, a weekly podcast from Max Future. Okay, welcome to the iPad Podcast. And hey, this is Lex at the maxfuture.com website. Today is August 21st, Sunday. It's a big day. And boy, there's been a lot of news. Some of it's iPad related. We're going to go through some iPad apps, some iPad devices. But it's been a crazy week in late August regarding tech news. So uh, thanks for listening and thanks for supporting the iPad podcast by Lex at Max Future. Remember, this is a chit chat free podcast. And you might want to check out, I did this, well, you'll hear about it, but uh, Hewitt Packard made some big news this week. And we'll talk about that news. But I made a bunker meme um, of the HP story, which is there's a thing on the Internet called the Hitler bunker meme, where you take a scene from a famous uh, movie called Downfall and you put new subtitles to it. And so it makes it look like the actors who are, you know, obviously recreating Hitler's last day in the bunker are talking about something else using the subtitles. So I did one of those things, and uh, I, I don't know. I think it gives some insight into uh, what's funny about what happened. Anyway, so check it out. It's on YouTube under the Max Future name on YouTube, and let's get to some of the stories. Okay, so the big news this week, or one of the biggest pieces of news this week, had to do with HP, Hewitt Packard. And it does affect Apple, and it does affect the iPad. Now, Hewitt-Packard is a very important computer company in the history of Apple because Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple, really was working there sort of, I don't know, straight out of college back in the early 70s when Steve Jobs and him had the idea to create the Apple company and create personal computers. And actually, I think they had to get permission from... Hewitt Packard because Wozniak was working at Hewitt Packard when, you know, I think they were doing some of the early stuff with Apple and Hewitt Packard let um, Wozniak, you know, keep that as his own intellectual property for Apple. But let's get to the bottom line here. Hewitt Packard, huge company, number one in PC sales in the United States, has the number one market share. It acquired Palm last year, the Palm company which created you know web os uh, which was considered a very good mobile operating system not as good as ios by apple and palm just didn't take off and hewitt packard bought palm for over a billion dollars a billion dollars and hewitt packard last year last fall said oh it was going to take palm and it was going to make you know a tablet device and with much fanfare Earlier this year, Hewitt Packard announced that it was going to release the touchpad, which was going to be like the iPad, but better, according to Hewitt Packard. And um, and in recent, I don't know, maybe 49 days ago or 50 days ago, uh, the touchpad was released, and it didn't sell well. And, and you know, and it was competing on the same price as the iPad. And why would you buy the touchpad if it was the same price as the iPad? Because one of the great things that the iPad has is a fantastic ecosystem, you know, hundreds of thousands of apps, and also the ability to run iPhone apps, of which there are, what, like 500,000 iPhone apps. And um, the touchpad didn't do good. And we heard through the summer how Hewitt Packard was slashing the price, you know, it gave it a $100 discount. Well, Hewitt Packard unleashed a shocker, a shocker on Thursday, the 18th of August, uh, when it was doing its quarterly financial results. Hewitt Packard said that it's getting out of the tablet making mobile mobile computing business. Uh, So it's, you know, in Basically, obviously, in the face of the iPad, the touchpad was not doing well. There had been reports that, you know, Hewitt Packard had shipped 250,000 touchpads to Best Buy, and Best Buy had only sold maybe 25,000 of them and wanted to return the rest. And, um, anyways, the shocker was it was a twofold shocker because Hewitt Packard also said it was going to get out of the PC business. 
It's looking to unload both businesses. Now, Hewitt Packard says as to the, you know, the WebOS business, it's not going to make tablets anymore. Uh, it's going to see if it can license WebOS, which is the operating system for other people to make. And this is crazy. I mean, this is crazy stuff. And the the guy who's the head of Hewitt Packard, Leo Apothecate, Apotheker or something like that. Apotheker, he's new. He joined a company from a big enterprise company called, I think, SAP. He basically attributed the jettisoning of the PC business and the troubles with the uh, tablet business to, or the web OS business, to the tablet effect. And by tablet effect, he obviously meant the iPad because that's the only real tablet that's selling in great droves. So it not only caused, uh, the iPad not only caused Hewitt Packard to, to shut down its own tablet and webOS business, the iPad also ca caused the biggest personal computer maker in the United States, Hewitt Packard, to say it was getting out of that business, that it was looking to sell its personal computer because of the, quote, tablet effect. So this is just an incredible, incredible bombshell and just shows how well the iPad is doing when one of its most significant or supposed significant competitor is essentially getting out of the business. So it's pretty wild. Now that no news was so great that the esteemed writer at TechCrunch, M.G. Siegler, who I read a lot, had a great article that came out that day and it was called HP to Apple you win and uh, he was pretty much shocked uh, he in his post that day uh, he basically said that you know tech uh, that Hewitt Packard's announcement was essentially quote Apple you win and um, I think he's absolutely right you know it's um, it's really a game changer and he pointed out that the writing was on the wall and HP perhaps he said um, you know maybe was reading it early but he was reading it clearly and what MG Siegler is saying and what he quoted what Steve Jobs said last March when unveiling the iPad 2 which is that we're seeing a major shift in computing and, and here's the quote from Steve Jobs Steve Jobs said quote I've said this before, but I thought it was worth repeating. It's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. That it's technology married with liberal arts, married with humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. And nowhere is that more true than in these post-PC devices. And a lot of folks in this tablet market are rushing in and they're looking at this as the next PC. The hardware and the software are done by different companies. And they're talking about speeds and feeds, just like they did with PCs. And our experience and every bone in our body says that this is not the right approach to this. That these are post-PC devices that need to be even easier to use than a PC, that need to be even more intuitive than a PC. And where the software and the hardware and the applications need to intertwine in an even more seamless way than they do on a PC and we think we're right we're on the right track with this we think we have the right architecture not just in silicon but in the organization to build these kinds of products and so I think we stand a pretty good chance of being pretty competitive in this market and I hope that what you've seen today gives you a good feel for that so MG Siegler was right to quote that because what we're seeing is a major shift in computing when the number one PC company in the United States who sells more PCs it says, I give up, I'm getting out, and I want to sell my PC division. And by the way, those tablets I, that I thought I would make to compete with the tablet that Apple makes, I'm getting out of that business too. It's pretty stunning, and we should just remember this day. Well, following that news... HP announced that it was slashing the price of the touchpad, the introductory touchpad, the 16 gigabyte one, from $500 to $99, and the 32 gigabyte one down to $150 if you could get it. And so there was a mad scramble. Some people asking, 
you know, was trying to get it from Best Buy, from Staples. And uh, at first there were reports that Best Buy wasn't even selling that reduced $99 uh, touchpad, that it was returning them all because it didn't want the headache of supporting them or that it would take away sales from other devices that were more expensive than $99. Because if you're a retailer, do you really want to sell such a cheap such a cheap device? I mean, where are your profits coming from? But then the story was that Best Buy was selling it. And why would you buy a touchpad? You know, it's running WebOS, which most likely will not be supported by Hewitt Packard in the future. Uh, it's a totally different operating system than the iOS that Apple runs on the iPhone and the iPad, and it's different than the Android operating system. So why would you get it? Well, there were reports that Hewitt Packard had um, run, found a way to run iOS on the touchpad, and that iOS ran faster. So, you know, you could buy the $99 touchpad if you can find it, just in the hopes that you could maybe hack it and put. Uh, Apple's iOS on it, if, and, and you would only do this if you're into hacking, or if you're pretty, you know, technically minded. There are also reports that people have hacked the touchpad and put Android on it. So if you could buy it and put Android or or um, iOS, it might be worth 99 bucks, or just as a collector's item, a memento. Now I went today to a Staples to see if they had it, and you know, it was very sad. They had one touchpad display model. And it's it, it, the sad thing is you walk into Staples and it's like the opposite experience of walking into an Apple store. There's just something so unelegant, so cluttered, so sad, so almost pathetic. And here I walk into the store and after the cash registers or after you walk in, before you get into any of the aisles, they have four different setups of tablets, none of them the iPad. There's the Motorola Zoom, there are the Kindle from Amazon, there was the touchpad, there was something else, and they're all just like one, you know, one display model. And there it was, one of them's already knocked out, the touchpad. And I asked one salesman if they have any left, and he said, no, they only had one, and the salesman wanted to get it for $99, but a customer had reserved it, so he couldn't get it. And it was just so sad. It's like, you know, you're looking at this, and Apple's sale of the iPad is like a juggernaut, because it's not just the device, it's how it's sold. You have these beautiful, stunning Apple stores, and there's iPads everywhere. There's like a plethora of iPads because not only are they selling iPads, but they've turned the iPad into this like glass kiosk, which informs you of the other devices as well as the iPad they're selling. So all over the Apple store, there's iPads, iPads for sale, iPads being used by the salesmen to answer your questions or to book stuff. And then these iPads that are kiosks and and it's just like a, a completely different purchasing experience than walking into Staples or into Best Buy or into, I don't know, Target. Um, so it's kind of sad. And I, I really don't know how these other tablets are going to compete. I think it's almost futile. Somebody, I think for anybody to compete, they're going to have to, they're going to have to seriously undercut the price of the iPad. And that's going to be hard to do because how can you do that without having a, a really inferior um, experience? Uh, now, one of the devices that really sells well is the Kindle. The Kindle's like what, 129 bucks, the little seven-inch Kindle, but it's but it's really cheap but very limited. It's not. It's really essentially a light mobile reading device. It's not a device for gaming. It's not a device for surfing the internet. It's not a device for running other apps. It's essentially a very limited device for reading. And I think people like it for that. It's black and white. It's not a touch screen. But I really don't know how in the short run anybody's going to compete with the iPad. Okay, the other big blockbuster this past week uh, that does in a way implicate or affect the iPad 
is that Google dropped a bombshell Monday morning this week by saying it was going to acquire Motorola, Motorola Mobility, which makes the Android smartphones as well as the cable boxes for $12.74 billion. Now, this was a bombshell for, I guess, a number of reasons. One reason is that, you know, Google makes Android the operating system for smart devices and for for tablets like the Galaxy, the, the Samsung Galaxy. And so Google's vision is that to give away the Android operating system for free and then have partners make smartphones or tablets. And so this is a bombshell because Google is buying one of its partners, which sends the message that, wait a second, it may be going the Apple model. And the Apple model is to make the operating system and to make the hardware and make it tightly integrated. Uh, it's also a bombshell because, frankly, Motorola is losing money. It doesn't make a profit. It has one-third the revenue of Google, but revenue is not profits. Revenue is like if you sold, let's say, lemonade, that's what you sell the lemonade for. Profit is what you make in selling that lemonade, you know, the revenue minus the costs. And Google is wildly profitable while Motorola is not. So it's kind of, I think it's kind of crazy to buy such an unprofitable company. But the real issue is, does this mean that Google is now going to make smartphones and tablets and make Android and the hardware and be the exclusive maker of it. Well, in the same announcement, Google went out of its way to say no, that it will continue to license Android to its partners and work with other manufacturers like Samsung, LG, uh, and others, which is a little, you know, a lot of people are very skeptical of that. How can you, there's two problems that I see. Well, there's many problems that I see. Well, one problem is, if you license off your operating system to a competitor, uh, when you make the hardware and the operating system, you face the possibility that your competitor is going to undercut you. So if Google is seeking to sell Motorola smartphones for a profit, then if, if you license that up, you're going to get somebody making a cheap knockoff. And then there's a, you know, you, this competition against yourself Apple did this in the 90s where it was making the Macintosh and then licensing off the operating system. And it, it just, you know, cut into its own profits, particularly in the higher end Macintoshes. So that's one problem. Another problem is really, are your partners who, who are making the hardware going to trust you not to favor Motorola since you, you know, since you Google own Motorola? So it's unclear now. Uh, some people think that Google bought Motorola just for its patents, just so it can protect Android against the, the litigation from Microsoft and from Apple. The thing is, though, Motorola, even with all its patents, is currently being sued by Apple and, I guess, Microsoft. So if those patents are so great, they haven't deterred Apple in the lawsuits. So anyways, this is we're seeing right now the, two seminal things happen, which just shows how big uh, Apple is in this space, and particularly the iPad. So I think we're going to see a lot of interesting stuff develop in the coming year or two because it's totally shaking up the industry. One article I want to quickly mention is in USA Today, that national newspaper, which had a really nice article on the 19th entitled, Apple's iPad iPhone Take Victory Laps. So basically, this newspaper saw the events of this week as basically an, as an acknowledgement of the success of the iPad and the iPhone. And the article starts off, Apple had a splashy week, and it didn't even announce new gizmos. That came courtesy of Google's Motorola mobility deal and Hewitt Packard's lightning-fast exit from the tablet market, both seen as nods to Apple's success. So, you know, again, it'll be a week to remember. Let's go on. Well, these announcements by HP and Google did not slow down Apple's juggernaut because Apple's not only selling iPads and iPhones like crazy, Apple is also seeking to protect its intellectual property, particularly against Samsung, which is very interesting because Samsung makes a lot of the components for the iPad and the iPhone, but Apple believes that Samsung has sought to rip off the look and feel of the iPhone and the iPad. And word comes from a website, Computer World, 
that Apple has filed a case in the Netherlands where it's seeking to ban all Galaxy smartphones and tablets in the European Union. Now, Apple had previously scored a big victory in Germany where it got a German court to ban the Galaxy series in all of Europe except Holland or, or, or uh, Netherlands. And then the court modified it to just say jurisdictionally it could only limit it to Germany. But Apple now, in a complaint in the Netherlands, seeks an injunction for the entire Galaxy series. And uh, it looks like there's going to be a hearing in sep on September 15th, or there's going to be a ruling by the court in The Hague on September 15th. And there'll be and um, there'll be a decision will t could be in implemented for an injunction by October 13th. So, you know, and my understanding this is basically saying that look, the Galaxy series tablet and smartphones essentially look so close to the iPhone and to the iPad that it's violating the trade dress or trademark uh, of those devices. So. Uh, you know, there's a little controversy. Some people are like saying, oh, Apple should should not litigate. Apple should compete. But wait a second. Let's hold your horses. Apple spent a lot of time developing these devices. And why do its competitors have to make them look exactly or very close to what they look like? If this was, and some people say, oh, Apple just did what was obvious with the iPad. Well, wait a second. If it was so obvious... How come we haven't seen these touch devices before? You know, where are these touch devices? Apple obviously designed it a certain way. And, you know, if Samsung, if a court thinks that Samsung really copied the look and feel, it's just like, you know, those in New York, people go down to Canal Street and you can buy a knockoff Gucci bag that looks and feels just like an, a Gucci bag, but it's not a Gucci bag. And they'll put like some sort something to make it look like a Gucci bag. And, is that fair? Is copying fair? Innovation is fair, but is copying fair? So, I don't know. I think let's leave it to the courts. These are big boys fighting it out. Uh, and if it's truly different, Samsung will prevail. Okay, so we all know that Apple is developing a new iPad. Of course it is. So the next headline from the Wall Street Journal shouldn't be that much of a su surprise because the headline on Aug August 19th, 2011 from a writer at the Wall Street Journal named Laureen Luck is Apple developing new iPad. So before you say, duh, um, why is this significant? Well, it's significant because it's the Wall Street Journal and the Wall Street Journal is a very reputable paper and it's not going to just make things up or speculate like some of the blogs do or some of the other papers. It's, it's going to go on hard news. And historically, the Wall Street Journal, when it says stuff like that, it's usually coming from a source, maybe Steve Jobs himself, deep in Apple. And the key thing is here is the information conveyed in this article uh, this week. And the key information is that the next generation iPad is expected to feature a higher resolution display. That's 2048 by 1536 compared to the present display of 1024 by 768 and um, that Apple has placed orders for components and that it's not coming out till early 2012. Now that totally makes sense. There had been all this speculation that Apple's going to come out with the iPad 3 in the fall. Now why would it do that? You know, the iPad 2 is selling like hotcakes. It can barely keep up with demand. Why speed up the process? You're way ahead. You have a big lead. You know, look, Hewitt Packard just like knocked itself out of business. Uh, and so why why would Apple accelerate uh, and release it in you know in the fall? I don't I don't I think that would be crazy. So, but this is good news because I do think the higher resolution sc screen is going to be stunning. I mean, already the iPad has a really nice screen. I mean, I have no complaints regarding the pixel density in the current iPad. And frankly, 10, 2048 by 1536, that's just enormous, uh, enormous pixel density. Uh, I mean, I think we could live with that kind of, you know, definition in the device for a very long time. So, you know, it's something to look forward to in the spring. And the Wall Street Journal is saying, this means I would go with them. 
they have a good track record and you know if you need an ipad now and you don't have one and you don't feel like waiting till let's say april of next year go out and get the ipad too and and let me give you some advice because what you can do is they have pretty good resale values i bought the first ipad and i sold it just when i bought the second ipad too and i got a decent price for it um you know it only cost me a couple hundred bucks to upgrade to the ipad 2 from the ipad you know there's there's a really good market for used ipads so you know you're not gonna like have your device go up obsolete if you if you buy it now you're gonna get a decent resale value and it's gonna be easy to upgrade that's what i like about them so let's move on okay so good news in terms of fast data networks um, it looks like apple is actively developing ios and that's the operating system that runs on the iphone and the ipad to work on what's known as 4g now some of you may not you know be up on this but you know what 4g what 3g are are the data connection speeds that the iphone and ipad have when they're getting data from you know to and fro the internet through cell phone data connections. That's something very different than Wi-Fi data connections. Wi-Fi data connections are nothing more than wireless signals at a local level that then hook up to some landline internet connection like cable. So in your home, you have a Wi-Fi connection most likely to your high-speed cable or some other DSL cable through your phone company but cell phone data connections are through a cell phone service like Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, or uh, T-Mobile, and they charge you a separate fee for that. And the thing is, three, what we have currently is what's known as 3G. That means third generation. And that data speed is somewhat limited. Now, the current iPhone on both Verizon and AT&T runs on 3G and the same with the iPad. The beauty of the iPad is you can buy an iPad that has no cell phone data chip in it, just has Wi Fi, and it's cheaper than one that has that chip in it. But if you have that chip in, you can get an account uh, with ATT or Verizon and have internet access and internet data connection even where you don't have Wi Fi. Like where I work, we don't have Wi Fi connection. So the only way if I wanted to use my iPad when I'm at work, I'd have to get an account with AT&T if I have an AT&T iPad or a, with Verizon if I have a Verizon iPad and try to get a connection. And the thing is 3G, the connection speeds are somewhat limited. And so what's going on now is Verizon uh, and the other phone companies are developing faster data speeds through the cell towers. And that that next generation of connection is called 4G, standing for fourth generation, uh, also known as LTE. That's the technology that Verizon's using. Well, word comes via uh, a website called Boy Genius Report, which claims that Apple has been testing um, 4G LTE enabled iPhones with carriers and pointed to an internal iOS test build of one of Apple's major mobile partners. And then Mac Rumors reported that since then, that news, um, it's been discovered that, the, that, the, that there is some LTE PLST file in the, the newest iOS 5 developer builds. Now what that means is, you know, iOS 5 is the next operating system for the iPad and the iPhone. It's probably gonna come out in late September and developers have been getting different builds of it and now they're on build six so mac rumors indicates that in this code are references to uh this lte which is the faster data network so so basically it sounds like apple's currently testing uh the iphone and the ipad with lte connections which is a really good thing because LTE is much faster and frankly I think Apple has to do this has to get the iPhone and the iPad on LTE soon 
Now, a friend of mine recently switched from the iPhone to a, an Android smartphone simply because it was on Verizon's 4G network. And, you know, the thing is, these the Verizon 4G network could get really fast speeds, um, you know, up to like, I don't know, even 20 megabytes per second download. The most I've ever gotten on my iPhone or my iPad had on 3g is like five or six megabytes per second and once you have 4g out there and it's not overused you could start getting speeds to really compete with the high speeds of cable and when that happens i see people cutting their cable internet and you know getting some sort of um, 4g hotspot device that they use everywhere for their ipad their iphone and their macintoshes so anyways, I think Apple, I think by the iPad 3, will have LTE in the iPad 3. I doubt it will have it in the iPhone 5, but anything's possible. Now, it looks like you're going to have more privacy in your iPad or iPhone, because the next version of the operating system, the iOS 5, it looks like it's going to be phasing out something that allows developers to track you. Now, this may not make developers happy but I guess people who like their privacy with their iPhone or iPad are going to like it and there's a story out in TechCrunch from Eric Schoenfeld that says Apple sneaks a big change into iOS 5 phasing out developer access to UDID. UDID is I guess the unique identifier for your device whether it's an iPad or iPhone. So as a user I welcome this. It says the article starts off on the 19th and says Apple is making a lot of big changes to its mobile operating system with iOS 5, which is dribbling out in betas for developers ahead of a general release later this year. But there is one big change some developers are just starting to take notice of that Apple isn't talking about that much. In a recent update to the documentation for iOS 5, it says Apple notes that it will be phasing out access to the unique device identifier UDID on iOS devices. Now look, I think Apple's doing this because it got some criticism from Congress and other privacy advocates because some of the apps, some app developers were sort of surreptitiously, surreptitiously uh, tracking users. So maybe Apple is doing this to take away the ability of developers and, you know, tracking you. Well, we'll have to see. I'm sure developers aren't going to like this. Speaking of iOS 5, the next operating system for the iPhone and the iPad, it's just around the corner, and it looks like it's going to get here sooner than later because on Saturday, uh, it released the, or recently it released the sixth beta of iOS 5, and um, it only comes two weeks after the fifth beta. And the betas are what developers use. And um, one website noted that um, the expiration date for using the beta is the end of September. So it's a good, there's a good chance that at the end of September, Apple will release iOS 5 for the iPad, for the iPhone. I think it's really going to change the iPad. Some of the key features that it's going to bring to the iPad is the ability to update the iPad without using a computer, just wirelessly over the internet. And that's going to be huge because there's got to be a lot of people out there who don't have a computer who might now be thinking of getting the iPad as their first computer. And they're not going to have to worry about syncing it up with iTunes on a computer. So that's one big thing. Another big thing is um, uh, I had played around with is I, I really love in Safari there's like a reader button in iOS 5 so you can just press a button and it strips out the ads and graphics that you don't want in a web page and gives you almost like an instapaper like reading in Safari that's really cool uh, and then of course there's the iMessages app so there's a lot of cool things in iOS 5 so my guess is it's going to come out at the very end of September and uh, you know I've been playing around with the beta I can tell you, you're going to love it. It's going to be a big improvement. Now, you know that the iPad has, is having an impact on television when Nielsen gets involved in the iPad app. Now, what am I talking about? There's an article out in the dailyfinance.com entitled, Nielsen to Gauge Effective Carriers iPad TV Apps. 
Now we've been talking about this for a while. A lot of the cable companies like Time Warner Cable, like Comcast, like uh, Cablevision, they have apps that allow you to watch most of their TV channels through Wi-Fi on the iPad when you're, I guess, around your your um, router that is connected to cable. And um, it's become a big thing. I think a lot of people are using it. Well, Nielsen is the company that gauges TV viewing. And the article says that Nielsen has finally launched an effort to measure whether iPad TV viewing applications have any effect on traditional TV ratings. And it says that in, they're looking at Time Warner Cable and Cable Vision Systems, which have their iPad TV viewing apps already downloaded more than 600,000 times for Time Warner and 200,000 times for Cable Vision. The article says, while the Nielsen assessment involves two of the most prominent cable TV operators, uh, as well as two programmers, it could have major implications for all service providers. It says that telcos such as Verizon already have been dabbling in their own tablet TV applications, but many service providers may still be hesitant to go much further. So this analysis by Nielsen could result in more apps coming out by TV providers to, in other words, have TV on your iPad. So this is a good thing for I iPad users. Uh, I think so. Now we've been talking in the past about how the iPad's use being used in enterprise, and one article this week really caught my eye in terms of how it's, you know, it's really getting everywhere. And this article is from the Green Bay Press Gazette.com. That's in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And basically there's an article out on August 20th entitled Hospital Records Go Mobile. And basically it says that a patient of of a Arlington, Texas physician um, has been, you know, shows up at the emergency room. Uh, when the doctor is not at the hospital, he doesn't have to wait long to start investigating what might be wrong. And it says here that an OBGYN doctor can call up an expectant mother's medical records on the iPhone. So basically the article is a survey of how doctors and hospitals are using the iPad. And, um, you know, it's very cool. It's a very lengthy article. And basically it says... You know, one one place called Bell and Health in Green Bay is in the process of migrating to an electronic medical record system called Epic, and it says Epic is developing applications specific, specifically for mobile devices for iPhones, iPads, and Android smartphones as well," said Troy Sheasel, director of information and services with uh, Bell and. So basically, the iPad it looks like you know there's been a quest in medicine. To have electronic records but you know one of the challenges is how do you make the records truly truly easy to um, you know to view and it could be that the the iPad as well as the smartphones are the way to go because um, it looks like you know these are devices that are sort of naturally gravitating towards hospitals and I think the iPads leading the way Okay, let's get to some apps. Um, you know, new apps are coming out that catch my eye. One app that caught my eye that came out relatively recently is something called Tabletop. And it's a $4.99 app for the iPad, and it's a music app. And, you know, we've seen music apps before, but this is kind of interesting because it's sort of like GarageBand in that it gives you many, many instruments in one app so it's basically you create your own like sort of digital studio and you can sort of have several apps in there and record several apps so i mean i kind of like that concept it's only five dollars which i think is cheaper i think GarageBand goes for 10 or 15 dollars from apple so what do you get with that you get a virtual modular gear you can plug the output of a keyboard into a delay to add an echo or wire it up to a mixer and adjust the pan. You can chain up multiple effects to create new and evolving sounds. And Tabletop supposedly is an audio playground where you can create beats, compose songs, mix live, make mashups with samples from your iPod library. 
and let's see now I guess there are in-app purchases so that's one way they they can charge more than five dollars but the basic app is five dollars so um, you can buy like all the effects for 99 cents um, you know so it's unclear what what you know d devices come with it but um, you know the in-app purchases aren't too expensive um, you know some of the interest uh, the effects are just 99 cents uh, some of the instruments are a little expensive for example gridlock which is a pad sampler um, normally costs nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents but for the five dollars they do give you a whole bunch of software that normally they charge so here's the software that you, you get you get gridlock which is the pad sampler for free you get a tone matrix for free which they claim normally goes for nine dollars and ninety nine cents you get a, a polyphonic steel stereo keyboard normally seven dollars for free you get master output uh, always free that's I guess the mixer you get a a channel mixer uh, the Goblin MX8 channel mixer uh, for free you get the spin back turntable player and you get a recorder and a filter LP low pass filter effects and the T101 trig trigger rater so it's an interesting concept where you get a studio, they give you a whole bunch of equipment, all for $5, some filters, and then they try to get you to buy additional instruments and filters and, and things in it. So look, if you're a budding musician and you have a garage band and some other, and some other devices, maybe it's worth spending $5 to sort of play around with this. The, you know, the screenshots of the interface look pretty good. Uh, it looks sort of like classic modules. The comments are three and a half stars out of 46 ratings. Um, one person writes, a lot of bang for a few bucks, surprised by how capable this app is for its price point. I'm a novice musician at best, but still appreciate that it's basically an entire music studio virtualized in an iPad at a fraction of the cost. Uh, let's see if we can find a bad review. I, I usually like to read some bad reviews. No, but generally the most recent reviews are four or five stars, which is a good sign. So, you know, you should check it out. I may, I may check it out and talk about it in the, uh, the next week's episode. But for now, I just have stumbled upon it. Okay, so the next app caught my eye because if, uh, if you're interested in developing your own iPhone or iPad app and you're just really in the initial planning stage, you want to see how much you know what it would look like on the ipad or how much it would cost or you know try to make projections as to how much money you could make with this idea there's an app um, called app cooker that came out relatively recently i guess it was updated on august 11th and it cost 19 dollars and 99 cents but it looks pretty comprehensive so I guess it was featured, they're claiming, by Apple as a staff favorite. But basically, it allows you to um, sort of drag and drop you, user interface concepts and sort of design your own app. And it looks like in the latest update, they've added some things that are sort of standard in the user interface. Uh, for example, table view. Uh, and you know it if you're if you're gonna make if you're gonna help someone design an iPad app it might be worth spending 20 bucks to use this um, use this um, program to sort of prototype right in your iPad you know what you want your program to look like so basically you can use it to prototype in um, a program uh, now you can't make the program because you need to use Xcode and coding so I just want to tell you right off the bat you you do not buy this app to to actually make a functioning app you use this app to brainstorm 
what you want the app to look like and then maybe even do some research with it it looks like to figure out if there's a market for the app um so you know it says here you can prototype using uh connecting wireframes to form a fully fledged mock-up you can import and edit graphics and then use the interface designer to combine these with the regular ipad and iphone interface elements and application templates you can manage your store information, then localize this into any 18 supported languages. You can estimate the cost effectiveness of your app by testing a range of scenarios to find the perfect pricing strategy. And you can automatically receive advice on your project based on your app's area of focus. So I'm not sure how they do that last part. Uh, and you can also export your prototypes to PDF or wire to a TV to present your app to the world. So if you wanted to, you know, pitch this app uh, to someone um, just to show them what it looks like. So, you know, it's interesting. It's definitely not for everyday people, but, you know, $20 if you're going to develop your own app or brainstorm your own app, it seems like it might be a decent tool. They claim that it's going to... Um, the price is going to increase to $50 in the future. Right now, it's $20. Speaking of apps and making apps, uh, there appears to be a wide range of people making apps. And there's a really nice article by the San Francisco, S San Francisco Gate, which is part of the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, that came out on August 19th about how an 84-year-old guy created an iPad app called Dabble, and uh, it was his first app launch. And I guess this guy lives in Brooklyn, New York. His name is George Weiss. He's 84. And he just released Dabble, uh, the fast-thinking word game, now available for the iPhone and iPad. And I guess, but this guy is a prior inventor. He received his first patent in 1958, according to the article. And he has spent more than 50 years tinkering in his Brooklyn basement. And um, and he basically was able to see one of his inventions brought to market earlier this year when his Dabble board game was produced uh, and picked up by Barnes & Noble. And now he's released Dabble, the fast-thinking word game, as a mobile game. So I guess it's also an, um, an iPad app. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, let's see if, what it looks like in the in the store. Okay, so there is another Dabble app in the store, but the Dabble app that we're talking about by the 84-year-old inventor, Mr. Weiss, is called Dabble the Fast Thinking Word Game for iPad. It cost $1.99. So far, out of six ratings, it's got five and a half stars. The one review is by someone named Grandpa Veer, and uh, writes, my grandkids made me download this game and I can't stop playing it. I absolutely love it. It's simple and challenging. If you like playing word games, play, give this game a try. So basically it's a, it's a word game. I guess it's available in storage as a board game. And at the core of the game lies a challenge, yet simple word game, the description says, that will help children and adults develop many useful skills, including vocabulary, spelling, and quick thinking. Dabble was awarded the 2011 Word Game of the Year by Creative Child Magazine. Well, that's really nice. So that's about it for the description. So it looks like some sort of, you know, drag, put words together, uh, sort of like Scrabble, but different. It's obviously marketing to the people who play Scrabble because the name is Dabble, which rhymes with Scrabble. And the idea is you put you put letters together to make words and you score points. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how you play it, but it's only $2 and it looks like a, um, it looks like an interesting um, board game. And in the um, description, it says Dabble has a rich history filled with talented individuals founded in George Weiss's basement, brought to store shelves by INI LLC. So, you know, if you feel like spurging, splurging $2 on a game, this looks like it's worthwhile. It's called Dabble. Okay, another game or app that you might want to check out 
uh, is a 99 cent app called Naked Truth HD. And it's basically a personal polygraph, polygraph app. So I don't know how well this runs or if it's a gag. It says in the description, do you want to have fun with your friends? The Naked Truth equals ask questions which you never asked before. Discover the dark secrets, strange habits, embarrassing truths of your friends. This app uses hand tremor to detect physical reaction during the test. You prepare questions and expose someone on polygraph test. While tested person answering on your question application measure physical reaction and calculate if answer is true or false. Anyway, you get answers and you can save and keep it like evidence. So they disclaim it's not a real polygraph tester because, uh, you know, obviously law enforcement would use it. So I guess it tries to take some polygraph stuff. It's been out on the iPhone. Now it's out on the iPad. Now the thing is, I guess with the iPad, you're not going to shake as much or maybe you would shake more. But it's an interesting parlor, you know, game in a way. You could sort of whip this out and test your friends. Are they telling the truth? It's got an interesting interface. I guess it looks like an old style polygraph. So people are coming out with all sorts of clever ways to use the gyroscope and the accelerometer. And um, the naked truth seems to be a, um, you know, an interesting game. Basically, you can test a sort of faux polygraph on your friends for just 99 cents. So I don't know, check it out. Okay, so a free app that you might wanna check out that looks kinda nice, that the uh, website Stylish iPad Apps on Tumblr uh, alerted me to is called BTC Dashboard, and it's free. And um, it's basically a way to sort of get news. Here's what it says. Uh, BTC Dashboard is the internet for the mobile generation. Dashboard is the new way of securely delivering enterprise content and information to a large number of users easily and securely. It says BTC Dashboard allows content to be presented in a unique story style where content can be made up of a mix of files, text, images, and more all combined in a single story. And it says the system presents content in multi-channel environment where users can group content stories into sections. For example, content can be grouped by news, documents, forms, etc. It says dashboard pushes feeds to users based on groups. These include content from outside world, including RSS feeds, social feeds, and other especially prepared content. It goes on to say the dashboard app includes the ability to read documents, view images and videos, and send comments. You can search for text, inside PDF files, view content pages, and much more. You will need an existing corporate account to use BTC Dashboard. So this appears to be a free app that uses, I guess, the btcdashboard.com service on the web in a corporate setting to sort of securely get RSS feeds in the corporate environment. So it's essentially, you know, if you are using the iPad in an enterprise set setting, you might want to alert the corporate IT department and the heads of technology to this app because it's basically a way to distribute content securely in a corporation using, I guess, the service btcdashboard.com. So it's, you know, it's once again, we're seeing the iPad migrating to be used in an enterprise setting. So interesting app. Okay, so I thought I would alert everyone to the fact that the number one free app in uh, iTunes for the iPad is a game and it's free. And it's a shooter game called Rage HD. Rage, R-A-G-E HD. So it's, you know, it's not for really young kids. Um, and it looks kind of nice. Um, it's actually rated 12 plus because it's got um, intense cartoon or fantasy violence. So you don't want to, you know, give this to any kid under 12. But it's, um, it basically is optimized for iPad 2 and has HDMI out TV output so you can play it on your big screen TV. 
It's got uh, an analog thumb, thumb, thumb stick added as a control option. And um, it's sort of like an arcade-like game of shooting up. So it's got mutants. You can arm yourself with a pistol, a shotgun, a machine gun. Um, so, you know, it's free and it um it looks pretty good so let me let me go to this to the ipad and show you on the ipad i've downloaded it and so maybe i can dabble a bit and show you what it looks like okay so this is what rage looks like um let's see if i can get it up straight it's upside down um so basically you start okay i'm paused uh let's resume it um, you basically just hold around the the um, the iPad and you use your finger to go forward and to shoot. Um, you know, it's got a very sort of nice graphic interface, and I guess um, I'm not sure exactly how you shoot, but it's got very nice mobility, and um, you can you know you can really sort of um aim it and you've got interesting graphics so it's um there are different levels um it's it's free it's a mutant shooting game called rage uh with uh let's see what some of the controls are here you've got sensitivity you can have left hand mode you can have horizontal invert mode vertical invert mode um let's see you can have a virtual window you have a gyroscope huh so there's just many ways to control it and um you know again it's free it's the number one game in the itunes store and i think it's worth downloading hopefully in future episodes i will have mastered rage and can give you a better demonstration but you know, my first impressions are that the graphics look pretty good. The responsiveness is pretty good, and it looks like a very professional game. Now, na last week I mentioned an app that was a, a, a good history app called The Presidents um, for iPad, The American Presidents for iPad. Now, it's a $3.99 game, and I didn't get a chance to show you it if you're watching the video version, but it's a massive, massive application. I think it was like a couple of hundred uh, megabytes like 250 megabytes I think something like that it took me a long time to download it and now I have it on my iPad and I gotta tell you it's called you know it you've got a picture in, of an eagle it's called the president's and let me give you a tour I really like it I've been using it with my son and it's really a good way to teach young kids about the president and what I about the presidents of the United States and their background and what I like about it is you have this sort of timeline and you've got these sort of cartoon-like but respectful cartoon-like pictures of the presidents. So it starts off with George Washington. Above, his, above the figure of George Washington, you have the period of time that he was the president, his name. And there's a timeline that he's standing on that shows you roughly when he was president. And it's a good way to sort of... Um, view where the presidents are now underneath the timeline there's a bar and sort of key dates are sort of positioned in the timeline underneath showing where the, those, those events are relative to the president so for George Washington to the left there's uh, like a little block that says articles of constitution ratified 1788 bills of rights ratified 1791 then after George Washington the Jay Treaty Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin and the 11th Amendment. So this is kind of a cool way to visualize the history of the United States relative to the presidents of the United States. And so and you just scroll and then you get, you know, John Adams and it goes all the way out to President Obama. But the thing is, there's so much content in here. It's very cool. Let's go back to you can zip through the timeline very quickly. Let's just pick uh, George Washington. So you cl you pr you click on him, and then you get like a bio, and you sc can scroll down. It gives you key bullet points regarding George Washington. You know, it said the bullet points are first president regarded as the father of the United States of America, 
dominant military and political figure from 1755 to 1799. It goes on, and there's like an like a short um, text biography of him regarding his pre-presidency, and there's a, there's a decent amount of content here, and you can scroll down, and there's related articles. Like, for example, here there's a related article, the Jay Treaty, Thanksgiving Day Proclamation, and external links to Wikipedia, the Miller Center, and POTUS link. And there's a gallery button. So all this for George Washington. And let's see, and the gallery button gives you pictures of George Washington. And if you click on the picture, you get the portraits. And you can scroll and see these classic paintings of George Washington. And so this is really multimedia and a very, I like the layout. You also have like these buttons on the bottom, territory, and that pops up and it shows you the, the territory at the time he was the president, the 13 colonies. So you click that and then you get a, a map of the United States that has, just shows the 13 states. And there's like a little button on the timeline and if you scroll it, it, it shows how the United States changes over time. So this is really well laid out. Um, again, let's go to the territories. You can also just scroll through that button to the 20th century. Then there are documents, and there's three documents in there. There's the, well, there's the Declaration of Independence for George Washington, the U.S. Constitution, and speeches. And then if you click speeches, it brings you to all the speeches in the app, which aren't just George Washington's, but also the Lincoln Gettysburg, FDR in World War II, FDR in Pearl Harbor. So, and then there's a quiz too. Um, and I guess this is, you know, uh, there's a quiz regarding the early republic. So it's a good teaching app. I kind of like it. You'll certainly, whoever's using this will certainly get to know not only the U.S. presidents, but some of their bios, but also all these events that occurred um, around the time that they were president that are key events. So look, if you have a kid who's, I don't know, anywhere between the ages of 6 and 13, I think this is a great, or even 18, maybe even college, this is a great way to bone up on American history. So you learn the presidents, but then you learn all these key events. So if I click, let's say, under, um, let's see, under um, James Garfield, there's something called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Well, I don't, oh, actually, I don't think anything happens there, but you know it's, it's there. Um, let's click James Garfield. So I click James Garfield. I'm going to get... Um, I'm going to get, I guess, the, the speeches that come from, from everybody. Um, so it's very cool. Like, you, you can, you can um, get FDR's, uh, I guess, speech during, you know, the European wars, World War II. So overall, I think, you know, I'm very satisfied with this purchase. It's called... The American Presidents for iPad. It's three dollars and ninety nine cents, and it's a it's a really nice interface. So check it out. Finally, I want to talk about one of the more interesting and cool devices that has been released to work with the iPad, Elgato, which has always made sort of TV recording, uh, I guess USB connection devices for the Macintosh, has come out with something called the Elgato HD Home Run Prime app for iPad 2, which I think costs about $20. No, it costs uh, $17.99, but it works with a standalone device called the HD Home Run Prime that costs a whopping $249.99. Now, this is what they say. The app on the iPad works in conjunction with the Home Run HD Home Run Prime, and you basically, it works with cable cards that you get from the cable company that you would plug in, and it enables users to stream and record on their iPad live premium KB cable TV. So you'll be able to like watch 
TV, uh, I guess, through the Wi-Fi uh, in your house. And this device, which will be connected to a cable card, will then stream the TV through Wi-Fi to your iPad running the $20 app. Now, it's all a little pricey, but the idea is you can stream TV, but not all TV because it basically will only work with those channels that are not scrambled uh, by the cable company. And it says here, Elgato's latest solution streams cable TV, quote, copy freely, end quote, channels to iPad 2. Users with Verizon Fios or Comcast cable television have a particular advantage since the majority of channels from these providers are sent with a copy freely flag. And naturally, users receive all the unencrypted digital TV clear qualm channels offered by their cable provider so so it's interesting i'm not sure it's going to work for it with anybody's cable or verizon connection but the idea is that you get this 250 dollar device you plug in a cable card from your cable carrier and then through wi-fi it works with your ipad and not only can you watch the shows but you can then record them in on your iPad and I guess it also records it in HD which you can transfer but you can't watch it in HD on your iPad you can uh, you can I guess watch it in SD so look it's all a little pricey but the concept here is it it's becoming closer than to a computer because I remember like years ago I, I had an app that somehow worked with my TiVo box and allowed me to copy TV shows uh, that were recorded on my TiVo and transferred them to my Mac. And this is a similar concept. Again, it's called Elgato's HD Home Run Prime app, which is about $18 for the iPad, but you need the hardware for it to work, which costs like $250, and it's called the HD uh, Home Run. So again, cool things are just coming out every day. All right, thanks for listening to episode 68 of the iPad podcast. This is Lex at maxfuture.com. Again, if you want an invite to the Google Plus uh, social networking service, just email me at maxfuture at gmail.com. I'll send you an invitation. I have a lot of invitations left. And if you want to see my little parody of the Hewitt Packard uh, dumping the touchpad and dumping its PC business, check out Max Future on YouTube. Just do a search on YouTube for Max Future and you'll see my parody of Hewitt Packard. Again, thanks for listening. Episode 68. Remember, this is a chit-chat free podcast. Any positive feedback on any of the places you get this podcast would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. It's been a Max Future production.